everyone, thank you for tuning in to today's webcast. My name is Dina Pagan, ARS Marketing Manager and your moderator for today. Before I hand it over to our friends at CAN, please know our house rules. We are aiming to provide the best webcast experience possible. You can help us execute this by keeping yourself muted and your computer web cameras turned off. The audio will be streamed. This means you will be able to hear us through your computer speakers. However, if you prefer to use the teleconference option, please use the information provided on your screen. Additionally, I will post the information on the chat box throughout the webcast. Should you have any questions during the session, please send these to me using the chat box. All questions will be addressed at the conclusion of every presentation. This session will be recorded. If you would like to view the recorded event, the file will be available later this week. We are extending the conversation on social media. If you would like to join us, please use hashtag ARF webcast. If you're interested in hosting a webcast of your own, please contact me at xena at the ARF.org. Next slide, Mark. Our next webcast will be held Wednesday, July 12th, where we will talk about new cross-platforms, TAMs, ratings, currency, and action. Also, if you're in the Chicago area on July 13th, Leo Burnett will be hosting the ARF for our regional event where we will learn how to invest in, create for, and measure the fastest growing and most impactful platforms of our time. And last but not least, for those in the Bentonville area on July 19th, Walmart hosts the Untethered Shopper Technology Unleashes Bricks, Clicks, and Swipes, and Voice. If you're interested in any of these events or other ARF programs, you can visit our website for further details or contact me at Zena at the ARF.org. And without further delay, I present to you today's webcast, Digital Engagement, What's It Mean, with Kevin Witcher, Senior Director of Product Management at Oracle, Pranav Yadav, the U.S. CEO of NeuroInsight, and Banu Bardwaj. So Senior Vice President and Principal at ROI. CAN team, the mic is yours. Hi. Hi, everyone. Mark Rappin from CAN. I mean, you see the lovely picture of CAN from you on the screen, hopefully. But we are, we are at the back. The other thing that happens at CAN, which people can experience, our cocktail party. So um, if you have some disruption, we have a direction, but there is a uh, cocktail party. On. Um, we're talking a lot about digital, and it's continuous, digital continues to rise, uh, almost surpassing TV now, um, more and more understood about digital engagement. And what does it really mean? Because digital means lots of things to lots of people. Um, so we're discussing outstanding careers, and that means both the creativity and the effectiveness. And digital en engagement is key to that effectiveness. So join us as we discuss digital engagement today. Uh, we're going to have Oracle present with us uh, who to target to get the engagement that builds brand value. We're going to talk about how it works. We'll hear from NeuroInsight on how it works neurologically, how your brain encodes the information it gets. And then most importantly, did I get what I wanted out of it? So we'll hear from IRI, and they'll look at performance tracking and, um, and attribution. And so without further ado, let me introduce Kevin Whitaker, uh, VP of Product Management at Oracle Data Cloud, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about targeting. Yeah. Hang on while we switch mics. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Kevin Witcher, VP of Product Management at Oracle Data Cloud, and uh, here to talk a little bit about how to target your audience. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is reach. Uh, when we think about what you're trying to accomplish with targeting, uh, there's two main objectives. You want to hit the people that, uh, for whom this is relevant, and you want to hit as many of them as possible. Uh, however, as uh, as you guys know, in the digital space, we've come a long way. We no longer need to hit everybody in order to hit the people that matter most. 
Uh, so this line here is, uh, this chart I should say, is the way we really think about audiences and audience quality at ODC. Uh, and it, you can see on the, from the left to the right here, we're talking about the total percent of online users reached. Uh, and then from the bottom to the top on the x-axis uh, is the category buyers reached. So in theory, if you just randomly threw impressions out, uh, you would hit that dotted line right in the middle, uh, and you would end up reaching some percent of the total online users and some percent of the total category buyers. However, uh, what's important here uh, actually is, is that we don't want to hit, if you throw out your entire audience, you end up hitting way more people than you need to in order to get the people that matter most to your brand. So, uh, a lot of publishers have come out and started talking a lot about uh, reach. Uh, and the myth here is that as advertisers, you have the budget to hit uh, an unlimited budget that can hit everybody. If you don't hit everybody, then you need to hit the ones that matter. So, here's the way this works. This represents about 150 campaigns uh, in the auto space. And what you can see is that auto advertisers do a slightly better job than average of hitting their targeted, their targeted audience. So, in other words, they're not, their dots here are above the line. They're hitting a higher percentage of category buyers than they are for the total online users reached. However, you could get all the way out to the end of this chart and, and still have missed most of your category buyers. All right, so as we look at this, there's different ways of breaking this down. If one target, uh, one, uh, one tactic would be to reach uh, as many category buyers as you want, but have very small reach, or you could sort of go anywhere out that line. Now, roughly 10% of campaigns end up in this, uh, in the point where you're actually reaching about 70% of total, on use, total online users and about uh, somewhere north of 40%. That's that far right bucket there uh, in red. The vast majority of campaigns actually have much smaller reach. So reaching only about 10% of an audience. Uh, it depends on how many uh, category buyers with targeting is. So that uh, every campaign reach everybody you need to hit. Let's think about this in the context of target. If you're a Mercedes Benz, uh, you could have a brand, obviously somebody who buys a brand, uh, Mercedes um, Or you step out from there, a, a bigger group of people is a category. Uh, as an example, these sedan buyers. Uh, then you could get even further. You could find a uh, farmer who's uh, no chance in hell that he's ever going to buy a Benz. And if you reach online, you're just as likely to hit him as hit the people that might actually buy Of course, this works categories as well. And in uh, female, we've got Burberry here. Uh, right in the center of the target is a, this woman who's bought this Burberry coat. She's a brand buyer. Perfect. Let's hit her. Uh, right outside of that, a bigger audience uh, and people who are likely to switch to your brand are the category buyers. And then down below, we got this uh, extremely pleasant woman who's not likely to buy Burberry no matter how many ads she gets. All right, same here. If you're Gerber, you definitely want to find people who've just had babies. However, you want to make sure those people actually are buying your category and aren't like the moms I know in Boulder making their own baby food and feeding it to their kids. And you definitely want to make sure that you're avoiding the uh, college kids eating pizzas. All right. So a lot of this talk about uh, reach came from this book, uh, and it's called How Brands Grow, What Marketers Don't Know. And one of the key insights in this book is that smart marketers know they need to reach all buyers. And they go on to explain that as buyers of the category, everyone from light to heavy buyers of a brand. This makes perfect sense. These are the people that are either buying your brand or might buy your brand. You want to hit them with a message. You want to hit them with brand awareness. You want to hit them with every message you can in the funnel. However, this has been widely misinterpreted uh, to say that smart marketers know they need to reach everyone. That is not the case, and no, nobody has the budget for that. All right. 
So we want to build a women's apparel buyers category, and we have three different methods of doing that. First would be demo segments. A lot of people target with demos. Uh, then we also have uh, all segments, all the different various segments we have available in the marketplace. And lastly, we can choose a model to pick the perfect audience. All right, let's just take a look at what this looks like. So you could, we have the same chart here. Uh, the performance index is looking at how much more likely is someone to buy the category that we're talking about uh, compared to national average. So 100, if you, if you index right at 100, you are national average, and that's effectively saying uh, your targeting is reaching a random sample. And at the bottom here, uh, from the left to right, is again percent of total households reached. So if the first audience we choose here, uh, which would be a natural audience to assume, would be a, a, demo, a demo audience of women 21 to 29. Okay, great. That's a, that's a useful audience. They're indexing at 133, so they spend 33% more on women's apparel than the national average. Uh, and it, it'll give you about 2.6% of the total reachable households. We'll try another one. Okay, uh, validated demo 45 to 49. Great. Just under 2% of households, also buying at about 127. The way this curve works is that as we add in all of the other demo segments, uh, you can see that you're doing better than average, better than random for roughly uh, half the segments I just put on this page. So half of them are overperforming a random run of, run of audience target, and the other half are underperforming. Uh, after, if you chose only those audiences indexing over 100, you'd still only hit 20% of the U.S. But we can do better than this. This is, this, this is ad tech, this is data. We now have the data to be able to do better than this. All right, so if we buy, these are all syndicated audiences off the shelf for us. If you bought senior fashions, uh, that is going to index at almost 180. So we're 80 percent more likely to buy the category than a, than a random audience, and it's going to hit 3.2% of households. The next audience would be the North Face. The North Face is another big audience, almost 6% of total households, at 162 index. So these two audiences alone, we've now got uh, roughly 70 to 80% improvement in how they buy the category, and we've hit uh, just under 10% of the audience. As you add on there, uh, there are audiences here that aren't relevant to the campaign. They also fall below this red line. However, uh, with, if you target your, your brand against people's buying behavior, you can reach more than 40% of the U.S. with segments that all index over 100. So we've now doubled our reach and not changed the price of our campaign at all. All right. How many category buyers did I fail to reach? Well, another way of looking at this, and this is that final approach on a, a couple slides ago, is a, is a specialty model. If we just created a custom model for this, we've got the same parameters here, percent of total buyers reached and percent of total households, we want to do better than this line. All right, if we do the demo segment, uh, as we showed earlier, we can do slightly better than uh, 100 index. Uh, but it peters out at around 40%. That's if we hit everybody. Now we take the all segments that we just talked about, the North Face and uh, senior buyers that we were talking about, and you can see the improvement in the curve here. This is a, a much longer curve. We're getting all the way out to 70% of the households reach if we reach everybody in these audiences, and a much buyer, uh, excuse me, much better buyer profile. So we're, we're hitting a much improved, more likely to convert audience here. Finally, if we, do, if we took a custom model and said, hey, for this women's apparel category, let's use all the data we have on hand to create a special audience for this, uh, we have a much improved yield curve here, and that's how we think about these as yield curves. You can see anywhere along this line, let's say you were like 85% of campaigns, you were going to reach 10% of the total online users, you'd roughly uh, triple your performance from the uh, random and you'd roughly double your performance just by using off-the-shelf audiences. All right. 
So, if you're if you're like 85 percent of campaigns, you're going to reach roughly 10 percent of households. Here's how that looks like: demo segments are going to are going to reach about 12-ish uh, percent of of the buyers. All segments reach about 18 percent of buyers, and then roughly twice that looks like about 33 percent from a custom model. Uh, now the nice, I, I uh, promise I won't take too much of this from uh, my uh, We we also do some measurement at Oracle Data Cloud, and when we've done me measurement on this, uh, we're seeing 80% increases in sales lifts, and 90%, almost 90%, 89% increases in penetration lift. Uh, there's 116 different DLX ROI studies that drove this analysis across 36 CPG advertisers and 23 different media partners. This is the type of performance you can get. All right, and this works across lots of other categories. So if we think about future department store spending and we use a data source like Visa, how can we assemble these items along the right-hand side to create the best possible story? All right, we've got yoga high spenders. They're big and they're the first ones, so they're going to come in. Then we choose a land of nod, proximity to store, then a children's product, high spend. And we end up with a long list of audiences using this audience optimization that shows us these are the nine best audiences to drive the highest reach of your buyers. Works as well for QSR, again using Visa data. Here, here we've got the buyer 20%. Using these nine off-the-shelf audiences, QSRs can reach 75% more people who are likely to buy QS. Not, I'm sorry, 75% more, more QSR buyers not likely to buy uh, than versus a broad reach campaign. All right, so what this brings us back to is how this, how this industry, going back many, many years, keeps coming back to the things they, they know well, not necessarily the things that work best. The key element here is we have the data to do better, and we should. In this same book, later in the, later, uh, later in the book, there's this quote from John Maynard Keynes. The difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping the old ones. Thank you, and good luck. Mark, I need you to speak into the mic, please. Fantastic. Hey, guys, how are you? I will tell you that I would much rather... Uh, hold on. If you can hear this music, you can get a feel for what things are like right now. And then it's incredibly hard for me to talk over this music that I want to dance to. But um, uh, let's talk about why we do what we do, right? Uh, in the... I'm looking at that camera. In the field of, of measurement of creative, we have to figure out how do we actually measure things that impact behavior. And the only thing that ends up happening, uh, uh, affecting behavior, are things like memory, specifically at the point of branding, right? So what happens when you ask someone a question? The left side of the brain goes, okay, I'm the rational side. I'm also where the verbal and speech centers sit. The right side of the brain goes, okay, I'm the emotional side. And there's no little to no direct connection between these two sides. So when you ask someone a question, the left side goes, I'm the responsible one. I'm going to answer. And it doesn't consult the right side. So you end up answering, not how you're actually feeling, but how you think you're feeling. Moreover, the past 5,000 years of philosophy or the past 100 years of neuroscience, 
will tell you that most of the decision making that takes place takes place in the subconscious. And by definition of it being in the subconscious, you don't have access to it. So asking people questions or having them fill out surveys is not going to get you to the answer. So then how do you actually get to the answer? In, in the field of advertising, uh, for many, many years, we've said emotion is a huge driver of effectiveness. And, um, you know, we've often seen cases where there are highly emotional ads that are not so effective in the market, and there are ads that are not emotional at all that are very effective in the market. So emotion can't be the driver. What we have found in our work is that of all the things potentially in the world that could impact, decision making, it is long term memory that actually impacts the behavior. So think about it this way. If listening to me for 20 minutes is an ad for what I do, the only thing that's going to make you look up what I do tomorrow is when my key message of branding has gone into your long term memory. And unless and until I've actually done that, you uh, will probably forget me or like, you know, I would be a blip in your memory. So I'm going to take you through an example. Here is an example of the Budweiser commercial that came out a couple of years ago during the Super Bowl, which is incredibly popular. It was ranked to be the number one ad. It was number one in the USA Today ad meter. 95% people liked it. Uh, there are number millions of online plays, and this is a fairly old number, so probably the number of online plays exceeded 100 million. And there are a bunch of social actions related to this ad. But here's a direct quote from Anheuser-Busch and Bev saying that, you know, we've done this commercial for a while and they don't really cause any kind of increase in the beer sales. So what happened in this ad that was incredibly popular but failed to cause any kind of increase in effectiveness? And here's a fun fact. There are a bunch of tweets from this ad uh, that, that we quote here. And all of them quote the puppy from the ad but not... Uh, the actual uh, uh, brand that was associated with it. In fact, if you look at the bottom right corner, you actually look at the hashtag from the actual commercial, which was Best Buds. And if you actually went and looked for bestbuds.com, you found uh, marijuana sales uh, because the brand forgot to even buy the domain name for that. So, before I actually get into the details, I'm going to show you what how most of our deliverables look like. My company measures the second-by-second second brain reaction to any kind of stimulus. In this case, it'll be an ad. And uh, let's look at a particular metric called long-term memory. So anything above that 0.7 line is most likely to impact your behavior. Anything below that 0.3 line is least likely to impact your behavior. And on the x-axis, just time. So 0 to 30 seconds or 0 to 1 minute, whatever the length of the ad that may be. And not every moment in the ad is the same. So we're looking at specific moments of branding and key messaging and seeing how people are reacting and whether that's going into your long-term memory or not at that point. So with that, I'm going to show you how people react to this ad on a second-by-second -second basis. I'm going to play this video. Hello. All right, so we saw it was a phenomenal ad, right? Like you see those green moments that are pointed out, there are peaks in memory encoding that you see during the course of the ad. And we see moments that are in like 99th percentile of things that we've tested. But what happens during branding? As soon as the end branding comes up, the memory encoding is actually going down. 
what the brand did was this is a classic case of what we a story. If your punchline ends without you branding, you actually haven't done anything for the brand. You've told a great story, but people are going to stop processing things as soon as they think it's the end of the story. If the brand comes after that, you've created entertainment, not an ad. So, in the set of memories that we have, we have two kinds of memories. Implicit memories and explicit memories. Most of our memories, 80% of them, are what we call implicit memories. Things that we will base our decisions off of, but we do not have the ability to verbalize. The very small percentage that we can actually measure by asking people questions are things called explicit memories. Uh, there are only about 20% of our memories. So, we need to look deeper to get better answers. So, what I'm going to do now, given this is, uh, we're talking about digital creativity, is that I'm going to take you through a few case studies that will be useful in, in developing creative going forward. The first one is a study that we did with Facebook. Facebook had two sets of people. The first set came in and watched a TV ad, a TV ad, and they came in the next day and they watched the same ad on TV in a different TV show again. The second set of people came in and actually browsed through their Facebook feeds. And they saw the same exact brand either in a video format or an optimized video format or in the form of a banner that we actually carefully inserted within their own personal feeds. And then they came back the next day and they now watched a TV show that had an ad for the exact same brand. And what we were able to show was that we saw an incredible amount of lift across all the metrics that we measure. Long term memory, engagement which is personal relevance, Emotional intensity, which is the amount of emotion, and emotional balance, which is the like likability of the content. Across all measures, when people saw the same ad on Facebook first and TV second, compared to TV first and TV second. What does that mean? It means that all the money brands may be spending on multiple exposures on TV may be better spent by spreading it out a little bit and having other channels prime the content on TV. Specifically in this case, Facebook. On the bottom right corner, you actually see a chart where we actually compare the ads that were optimized for Facebook versus the exact ads that people used on TV. And the ads optimized for Facebook actually ended up performing a lot better as well. So two things to note. One, we must consider a multi-skin environment where we use a multi-skin environment to prime our traditional environment like TV and that works better and two the optimized version for specific channels works better as well and I'll get into how do we optimize content for specific uh, channels in the in the next few slides another one of the studies we did was with Twitter and I'm gonna play the slide video and then we're gonna talk about it alright we just had the video fail so I'm just going to talk about it. Essentially, in this study, we had a bunch of people come into our facility, wear our headsets. So they were watching TV as we measured their brainwaves. But as we did that, we also allowed them to use their phones and get on Twitter. And they had the choice to either tweet about the show that they were watching or, uh, or, or anything else that they wanted. And what we saw was that during this entire experience, people had a certain level of engagement with the TV show they were watching. And when it actually fell down, that's when people switched to the second screen, which seems natural. And then their engagement peaked, as it should, because now they're dealing with a personal device, has a lot more engagement, and so forth. But when, the, when these people actually tweeted and put their phones down and came back to TV, what we saw was that there was a readjustment period where you're going from a period of high engagement to a low engagement. But the readjusted engagement by the end of it was on average higher than what you actually left before you switched to the second screen. So what this study actually said was that the presence of a second screen doesn't really harm the first screen. It actually helps the first screen because it actually helps lift the engagement. There's some transference of energy from one device to another. And then... I'm now going to talk about how do we actually optimize our content 
for different platforms and devices. So what we have realized during the course of the work that we've done for the past few years is that every little screen seems to have its own neurostate. A neurostate is nothing but the balance or the imbalance between the left hemisphere of the brain versus the right hemisphere of the brain. So either you're noticing more details within the media or you're noticing more the emotions within the media as you're beginning to watch things on that by definition of the media platform that you're watching it on. So the way to actually curate content for each platform, the first thing you need to do is identify what we call are the iconic triggers. So what are the moments from within the 30 second or a minute or longer advertising that people will remember forever? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through an example of how we do this. So I'm going to play a CoCAD that we tested and you're going to see how people reacted to it. All right, so in this commercial, we recognize that there were a few moments that actually were going into people's long-term memories. Those are what we call the iconic moments. These are moments that people will remember for a long time. And what we can do with these moments is we can use them in different, across different screens and platforms to recreate the entire experience people had with this one commercial. So in this case, there were like a couple moments that were going deep into memory. I mean, after looking at other metrics, we decided to pick the first image. The second thing we do is we actually figure out what is the neurostate, as I described earlier, for each platform. And during the work that we've done over the past few years, we realized that laptops have a highly global neurostate. So they, people process a lot more emotion when they're watching things on their laptop. And then are the phones they're still emotionally biased because again very personal devices you're seeing a lot of other personal stuff you're getting a text for your mother at the same time so it's fairly emotional as well whereas when you view content on tablets and TV you are primed to actually notice more the detail within the content that you're seeing so it inherently has what we call a detail biased neurostate so what we do is then take the creative and look at the biases the creative may have had between the detail processing and the global processing during the entire time. So the red line in this graph is memory encoding for detail. The blue line in this graph is memory encoding for global features within this ad. And we look at moments that actually have a, a, a emotional or global bias. And the next that we look at is what are the vignettes within this ad that actually has a detail bias. And then the third step to take is use this information about the creative that you have and the biases each vignette may have and use the information about different screens that you have and combine it with, uh oh, and combine it with combine it with uh, the information that you have on the different uh, uh, devices to cut different kind of content accordingly so you can curate content for each kind of platform I had a video there which doesn't seem to be there so I am happy to move on and give it to the next presenter
from us? No, no, no. It's me. On your chair. Yeah, I'll just hold it. Is that okay? Does it look okay? Move it down a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, okay. Hi everyone. So uh, now that you know we've talked about how to create a, a fantastic audience and how to create a fantastic uh, creative, I will talk about did it really uh, drive those uh, valuable consumers and drive you to get the sales that you wanted. So uh, as I take you through this, what I will do is I will talk about you know what a good measurement solution looks like, what it should have, and then I will walk you through a case study of a client who did it well and what were the learnings they had and how they implemented it. So uh, just to re-emphasize the point on uh, the importance of measurement today, so this is research from the IAB that is showing that uh, for most companies and most brands, advertising uh, measurement and attribution today is the biggest uh, challenge in front of them. They have uh, built some learning on how to uh, model, how to recognize their consumers, how to do cross-device uh, audience recognition. So the next step for them is to see that have those efforts really impacted uh, the sales and have they really impacted the consumer behavior. So uh, with attribution being so important, measurement being so important, let's start talking about what, uh, what, what role measurement should, should play. So measurement has to be a part of your overall marketing plan. Right, so, uh, so measurement cannot be in silos. So you have to uh, think of it as a closed loop. You start with understanding the consumer, creating those insights about the consumer, planning your media, executing it to reach that right target audience, and then a measurement. I know my colleagues, uh, my, my friends before me talked about the insights and the targeting, so today I will talk about measurement and optimization. So, uh, you know, traditionally there have been two ways of measuring uh, me measuring sales impact. Marketing mix has been around for several years and is known and a well-tested way of measurement. And the second way of measurement is sales glyph. Marketing mix really works on an annual plan measurement basis. It's really good. It gives you a very strategic view of things. It looks at changes over time and hence attributes the uh, change in sales to different marketing inputs. Sales lift, on the other hand, is a user uh, or a consumer level measurement solution. It looks at individual users, looks at their uh, media exposure, and their sales impact. It's, uh, it has the ability to be real time. It has the ability to be extremely, extremely granular. So for today's digital advertising, sales lift is really uh, the way to go. And what a sales lift measurement solution looks like is that it should be able to give you impact on sales, so which is sales lift from exposure to a marketing input. In this case, it would be a digital input. Uh, it should also be able to break out for you what is the impact on household penetrations, what's the impact on purchase occasion, and on uh, spend for occasion. Because these are critical elements that household level data uh, allows you to track and how allows you to optimize to. Some of the critical attributes of, uh, of a really good solution are going to be speed. We know in the digital um, age, everything is planned real time, so a measurement solution needs to be able to provide results with that speed and with that, uh, with, with that alacrity. 
it should also be granular. And the reason it should be granular is that if you have speed and if you're able to understand performance really quickly, you want to take action. And the only way you can really take action is if you have granular insight. It has to be very accurate because you know you don't have time to validate anything. This is your in-market validation. So accuracy is very important, especially as you start looking at that granular uh, insight. You want a very accurate solution. It should have viewability, and it should be look at uh, be able to look at any kinds of campaigns. And that's important because often digital uh, tends to be where brands are experimenting the most. So you want to be able to read smaller campaigns, smaller brands, and measure the impact. So, so with that expectation of uh, a sales lift solution, you also want to make sure that it works with the marketing mix. And you know, marketing mix, as I said, has been around for a long time, but marketing mix and uh, sales lift can work in tandem. So marketing mix uh, is part of your annual uh, evaluation, part of your annual uh, reallocation of spending, and your media planning. Lift, however, is all about looking at that one campaign, uh, optimizing it, and um, measuring the campaign results, optimizing that campaign as well as subsequent campaigns. So, so they really work synergistically, one feeding into the other. So, so what does a sales lift measurement, what does a good sales lift measurement have to have? So there are three elements to what a good sales lift solution should have. It should have really good data, it should have a very good technology, and it should have good partnerships. So on the data side, there are definitely pitfalls, right? So the data could be uh, coming from a small data set. It could be coming from very different data sets that don't really talk to each other. It could be uh, in, in a position where you're not able to track viewable impressions. It could be that it's not able to track factors outside of uh, the specific digital or media input that you're measuring, but you want data that actually is able to capture all marketing inputs that, um, that a consumer is hit by so that you can attribute correctly and accurately. Going back, accuracy, going back to the uh, notion of accuracy, data is the foundation of that accuracy. The second part that enables the data and the accuracy and the measurement is the technology, right? So we want something that's uh, that's real time, and uh, if it has to be real time, it has to be enabled by technology. It has to be able to deliver the results in a way that's truly actionable. Does not uh, is not a static deck output is delivered to the decision makers in a form that's uh, very easy to digest and very easy for them to action upon. And the third leg of the solution is is partners, right? So understanding uh, that you know media decisions are influenced by several uh, parties, and that 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 number of um, influencers is growing exponentially. It has to be a solution that's uh, acceptable and that is uh, integratable with multiple partners. So with those three um, three elements, what a good solution really looks like is that it should have all important outlets that you're trying to measure for for your brand or category. It should have accurate uh, content data. It should have causal variables or variables outside of the media input that you're trying to measure that could potentially drive consumer behavior and consumer purchase. It should be on a dynamic platform that is able to support granularity and speed. And on the partner side, it should be agnostic to who is the partner that you're working with. And it should be integratable with several uh, media sources as well as measurable, ma uh, mar manufacturers. So if you did have a solution like that, what could you expect? So a solution like that can enable in, in flight measurement and optimization. And what we have seen is that it can uh, result into up to a 70% improvement in ROAS, right? So you could go from uh, a, 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 an ROAS that you're currently having to one which is 70% higher. And in what situations could you use a solution like that? You could use it for in-flight uh, optimization. You could use it for cross-channel measurement. You could use it for creative testing, audience refinement, and, uh, and new product launches. And the solution to be able to do that, it has to uh, it has to meet certain requirements, right? Because it's not that easy to hit that 70% improvement, right? So it should be able to understand the who, where, how often, and with what of um, of your marketing plan. So 
it should be able to tell you of your different target which one did the worst or which one did, did the best so you can reallocate. It should be able to tell you which channel or which publisher really outperformed you for you because that's what you will, uh, you, you will reallocate. Frequency is critical, right? So we spoke about uh, reach a little while, while back. Kevin talked about reach, but reach goes hand in hand with frequency and you do not want to oversaturate your consumer. So you want to hit the right frequency without, uh, without that, ad sa uh, that saturation. And uh, then with what, right? So which uh, format, which uh, creative, and which ad size did well. And these are critical elements of the granularity that your measurement solution should be able to provide you so you can then uh, optimize, uh, optimize performance. And uh, you know, measurement alone is not sufficient because you want to be able to take decisions. And there are several uh, other hurdles to taking, uh, taking that action beyond just measurement. So the, uh, so, so the other key elements to think about are uh, organizational alignment and alignment with media partners, right? So as I said, you know, there's, there's a whole host of ecosystem of uh, players who are involved in making the decisions and then actioning the decisions. So all of those steps are important. Uh, I think it's really important to have a strategic uh, learning agenda up front, uh, a test and learn, learn approach. And then once you've started uh, the process, having a benchmark that can inform and um, help you validate the results as you're seeing them is critical. So now that we've understood what a solution looks like, let's look at some, uh, some results fr from a case study. So what I'm going to share with you is a case study of uh, a food and beverages uh, brand. And the objective for this brand was to do real-time measurement and real-time optimization. And they wanted to understand what is it that they could change to, uh, to improve the performance of their campaign. The second thing they wanted to understand was that, you know, impact on sales lift is not enough. How did it change the consumer's uh, core behaviors? Did it change penetration? Did it change uh, buying rate? Did it change how often they are going to buy? So that was important. And the third thing that was important to them was, you know, how does sales lift work with a marketing mix? So what, uh, what they went through was the process. So you know, first they looked at what are the different measurement options. So they looked at marketing mix and they looked at list and they said, you know, okay, so marketing mix is not going to help me answer all of these questions. It'll help me answer some of them, but not all. So they decided to use uh, Lyft. Uh, they then uh, went ahead and shared their plan, their learning agenda with their uh, internal organization as well as their agency. So their agency was poised to take action and make the, uh, the changes that came out of recommendations of the measurement solution. They then uh, adopted a test and learn. So you know, they did not take action just from the first campaign. They went through uh, a couple of campaigns and then started using the learning to, uh, to make changes. And lastly, uh, you know, the plan is to expand this to the entire uh, portfolio for, for, the, for that manufacturer. So let's start looking at what the results started showing them. Uh, before that, I just want to talk about you know how the measurement would work. So uh, a sales lift solution like IRI Lift um, combines uh, exposure data. So so the exposure data is collected from whatever uh, device or whatever uh, channel format, etc. It's uh, it's delivered on. So it could be TV, it could be digital. In this case, it was digital including mobile, um, and that is then combined with household level uh, buying behavior data. So that's uh, your loyalty card data typically, so you combine those two. The second step is uh, to create a control for the test. So usually we are reading these campaigns in market, so we would create a synthetic control for, uh, for, for the tested um, group. So we run some diagnostics to make sure that you know things, things are uh, readable, we don't have any um, any outliers. Uh, then we run some models, and then uh, the final step is to project the data at an out all outlet level. So the most important thing uh, I think to keep in mind is that all the data here is at a household level. So it's not a time series model. It's instead a household level uh, exposure versus exposed versus unexposed model, and then we look at um, look at changes in in behavior. So in this case, the first thing that uh, you know the brand was interested in looking at was the mix of publishers. So we looked at about six publishers, uh, and you can see there was significant difference in uh, the performance of the uh, of the six publishers and also of the CPM. 
Right. And that's very important because we know that a lot of uh, uh, a lot of publishers or touch points can be extremely uh, effective. They may drive sales, but at a very high cost. So the balance of the sales impact and the uh, and the spending information is is, uh, is critical. So in this case, uh, they found that publisher um, four for them was fantastic because it was generating a very high lift at a very very economical cost. Publisher uh, five gave them a good lift, but the cost was extremely extremely high. So a very obvious decision for them was to um, to take publisher five out of the mix. And since they were getting these reads uh, weekly while the campaign was happening, they were able to remove this publisher and optimize their campaign while it was running. Um, the next uh, and other uh, most critical part of a, of a campaign is the targeting, right? So we talked about how uh, getting the right audience is critical. The right measuring of the right audience is equally critical. So in this case, they looked at different uh, different targets to see which one was performing the best. So uh, the contextual in this case was severely underperforming, and it was uh, almost the second largest investment in terms of target. So clearly, an opportunity for the, them to reallocate to a Hispanic and purchase-based targeting, which was not a very uh, large part of their mix. What was what's also interesting is that with this uh, this level of data and this granularity of analysis, we can deep dive into a single audience type. So here we deep dive into the uh, Hispanic target group and we looked at the performance of the Hispanic group. How could it be improved? Uh, so we looked at ad type. So we looked at a video and standard manner and we looked at creative. So we looked at animated versus static. right? And uh, just changing the ad type and changing the creative can help this um, target perform so much better. And that two level interaction is becoming very, very important because brands are now starting to customize their creative, customize the, uh, the, the medium at which they are talking to, to a certain uh, consumer group. So, <coughs> so being able to read performance at that level is helping them with that actionability and with that uh, improvement in performance. We also uh, can look at different uh, purchase-based groups and cut them out further. So in this case, the brand wanted to look at competitive loyalists, brand loyalists, and brand switchers. And they were able to see that they're driving a very high um, sales lift amongst the competitive loyalists, which is, which is, which was fantastic because that is exactly what their, uh, their objective was. They were also able to see by different uh, groups, so by different um, buyer groups, how did the different consumer metrics change? So in this case, Though the um, uh, the purchase based uh, audience gave them the second highest lift, it really helped them drive penetration, which was their their big objective. Uh, an additional benefit was that uh, this group also drove uh, uh, drove occasions for them. So getting that understanding and understanding what your consumer is doing um, at this granular level can be done at, uh, at, at the different uh, tactics and that helps improve and sharpen the media planning and the, uh, the strategy for the brand. Uh, the next thing I want to show is that you know, how we track this performance over time. So this uh, brand was looking at reads over, uh, over different points in time. So we started reading this about uh, November and we were doing bi-weekly reads in this case. And you can see how um, every uh, quarter they were accumulating uh, the reads and seeing how their performance uh, changed. It is a seasonal brand, so they did see certain spikes in certain time periods of the year. And the spikes were different by different consumer segments. That gives them good insight on how to uh, how to plan their media over uh, over time, and they change uh, they made some changes real time. But I think it also helps them when they plan the media for this brand next year, and they will know which targets to focus on at different uh, points of time. So that, in summary, was uh, you know the uh, the result that we saw, and um, just a quick summary of you know what are the uh, success factors. So I think some of the key, uh, the key things are that, you know, use a measurement solution which gives you the best coverage of data, is technologically superior, and has strong partner assets. Uh, 
ensure that you get the uh, read real time uh, with the granularity and accuracy that will make you confident of taking the decisions that you need to take. And last but not least, I think organizational alignment and getting your partners aligned to the uh, objective and aligned to uh, you know the actionability and how soon the action needs to be taken are critical as well. So with that, I think um, I'm going to hand it back to Mark. Hey, Mark. We're done. Yeah. You're going to close it? All right, everyone, I'd like to thank Oracle Data Cloud, NeuroInsight, and IRI for taking the time to present, taking their time during their trip to Cannes to present their work to our webcast crowd. And thank you to everybody who was able to join us. I hope you join me at our next webcast on Wednesday, July 12th. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.